Welcome to the screencast for Puzzling Out Knowledge by Susan Hack. This article is on page 91 in our textbook. So before we get started with this article, I want to think about all the topics we've covered about knowledge so far. The first thing we saw is that a traditional philosophical definition of knowledge is justified true belief. The second thing is that Gettier showed us that justified true belief might not be good enough to count as the definition of knowledge. Russell made us question how we know things are true. We might normally think it's our senses, but he thought there was a distinction between appearance and reality. And Phillips told us that context and environment matters. It's not just little bits of the outside world and our minds in two separate realms. It's how everything goes together in different circumstances. It's not individual bits of information that count as knowledge. It's something more globalized. Now, Hack is going to expand on that idea that context matters with a view that's pretty close to one that's known in philosophy called holism. So we're going to think about more ways that we might use justification to call our beliefs knowledge. And instead of one through four, where it's all about single statements, holism thinks about our entire body of knowledge, systems of evidence that do work to justify any given belief. So you're not going to be apart from every single other belief that you have whenever you run into a new statement. So say you've never ever thought about the causes of civil war in Eastern Asia. But if you ran into a news article and you had to decide if that journalist made a good case as to whatever the causes were, you would be relying on a whole body of knowledge that you already have knowledge that you have about why countries go to war in general and um, what, if, whether or not you think any war is ever morally justified, stuff like that. And that even relies on more basic ideas that you might have of human nature or violence or what's right and what's wrong. You're not going to be deciding that specific new belief, whether or not it counts as knowledge, in a bubble chamber. And Hack does a, an extended comparison to crossword puzzles, solving crossword puzzles, um, when she does this. She says most things in life have a complex system or web of information that surrounds them. I've mentioned before, and I'll mention again, that this can be really confusing when we're trying to figure out if what we believe is true or accurate. Uh, it's hard to sift good evidence from bad evidence, and in some cases, it's hard to find evidence in the first place. We might not even know where to start. And unfortunately, there's no simple method that we can learn to take that difficulty away. In a complex world, it's always going to be there. So what can we do? For an example, Hack gives us um, a meteorite discovery in Antarctica in 1984. Some Scientists thought it came from Mars about 11,000 years ago, and it contained a little sample of something that some scientists thought was fossilized bacteria. So that would be proof that there was life on another planet. But then others believe that what looked like that bacteria was just an artifact of the instrumentation. So the technology itself created some noise. And uh, how could you differentiate between them? How could you tell what kinds of reasons would sway you in either direction? For that matter, how can you tell how old the meteorite is, that it came from Mars, or that that's what fossilized bacteria looks like? It's a complex web of beliefs that would lead you to one conclusion or the other, nothing in isolation. 
So she says that we can make a comparison to crossword puzzles. When you're deciding to how to fill in clues, it'll depend on a few factors. If you're looking at one specific clue, how well is your answer supported by both the clue that's given to you and the already completed intersecting in, uh, entries? So you might have a five letter word and you only have the second letter and it's an E. So is that E reliable? And does the clue give you enough of a sense of what it means? You can, you can think of a word that has E as the second letter. Also, how reasonable are the other entries? Independent of whatever you're doing for this current entry, are the other ones reasonably filled in? And the last thing you want to consider is how, what percentage of the crossword has been completed so far. So again, you're looking at the whole entity instead of just one bit. And she says there are similar rules for evidence. If you take any particular belief that you have, you can subject it to these three questions. How supportive is the evidence that you have in, of the claim in question? So if you think about the meteor, um, meteorite again, if it were fossilized bacteria, that would be very supportive of the claim that life has existed on other planets. Uh, how comprehensive is the evidence that you have? If you just take the fact that it may or may not be fossilized bacteria, it's not very comprehensive at all. You need a lot of other data to be able to decide. And how independently secure is your evidence? Can it be explained in other ways? Is one way of putting that last question. Let's actually go back because she has a couple other, I think, illuminating examples, and this is on page 92. So we can have disputes about what evidence says about a claim. You and I might be doing the same crossword puzzle, and I have an F in the middle and you have a D. So we need to figure out the evidence each of us has for our competing claims by looking at questions one, two, and three. Um, she has another example about, uh, she has a couple more theoretical examples, but in the end, she has a real world example. She says, in 1944, Oswald Avery published his results about DNA. He thought DNA was the package of cells that created genetic heritage. So before genetics and microbiology, we knew that we had um, hereditary traits. We knew that parents passed things on to their children, but we didn't know the mechanism. We didn't know what biological parts of us were actually doing the transferring between generations. And the competing claims were DNA and some sort of folded protein. And at the time, DNA was really new, uh, and people thought it was too simple of a conglomeration of cells to really be the genetic carrier. They thought, we know that there are four, um, four nucleotides, there we go, the G, C, A, and T, and at the time scientists thought they were in a regular order. It just went A, C, G, T over and over and over and over again, and that was way too simple to carry genetic information intergenerationally. And this guy, Oswald Avery, thought it was DNA, but nobody believed him. And generations later, obviously, scientists changed their mind. And the, the context and the web of knowledge surrounding it slowly changed enough to be able to change the truth of the claim. Hopefully that made sense. I know I was a little bit hesitant. Okay, she mentions that sometimes we have a failure of will because it's a long, hard slog to get to the truth or the truth might upset our goals. So her examples are a detective might 
not care about who committed the crime. They just want to close the case. She talks about herself, about how she, if she's done months of research and somebody brings up an article that might destroy all that research, she doesn't want to go read it because she'll have to redo all that work. And that's how we can stray from gathering the comprehensive web that we and deciding and judging on it. But even when our will doesn't fail and we try our hardest and our best to get to the best supported answer, we might often fail. She says on pages 92 to 93, our senses, imaginations, and intellects are limited. We can't always see or guess or reason well enough. With ingenuity, we can devise ways of overcoming our natural limitations, from cupping our ears to hear better, through tying knots in a rope, or cutting notches in sticks to keep count, to highly sophisticated electron microscopes and techniques of computer modeling. But of course, in any given time, and that's my addition, any given time and place, our ingenuity is limited. So we might not be able to get to all of the evidence in the first place let alone use our reason to process it. So the conclusion is that doesn't mean we should despair. We're part of a deeply social and interconnected network of learners and thinkers and reasoners. It's intergenerational and it's always dependent on what came before us. So the only way that we can make leaps in knowledge is because we have a whole solid body of knowledge that's been built up over years. I think I put the Isaac Newton quote in the last screencast, but he talks about the only reason that it seems like he could look further is because he was standing on the shoulders of giants. And that's one of the conclusions of holism. There's never any one person or one belief that counts as knowledge. It's always this whole messy and complicated system. So we can look back and we can think about how Hack is different to Russell. And this is where we can call Hack the holist and Russell an atomist, because he thought knowledge came in statements or propositions or single beliefs alone. So Russell looks for meaning and truth and knowledge in the smallest bits of information. Hack and Phillips, on the other hand, look for it in the body of information that we've we've built up for hundreds of years.